Is that why writing on a legal pad for you is like a better process? Because you're okay with it being messy right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when it goes into sort of type format, you want it to be more in line, and it's like a signal to you. Well, I think it's it's um, it's kind of it's not to make it sound all like, ooh, ooh, but it's kind of like sketching before painting. You know, it's kind of like, let me draw this out, see what it's going to be. Now I'm going to put paint on the canvas. So if I if I know the bare bones of the story and I write with just the bare bones, then other ideas are going to come in, other things are going to happen. Sometimes I will find that my bare bones are wrong and that maybe I found a better bare bone or maybe I find that that bare bone it was one thing in, in Bob Berry's things. It was actually part of the 11,000 word thing, but I, it was great. You know, I never got to write like this. It was like, oh, wow, I'm writing well. I'm going to describe every inch of this room. You guys are going to know everything about this motherfucker. It's going to be great. And then I'm like, yeah, it's just way too much. It's way too much. You don't need this. But you have to have some kind of fun writing. It's got to be some kind of like, it's a, like, I enjoy it. I never, it's never hard. I mean, sometimes it's hard to get going, but I, 20 minutes, I look at the first 20 minutes as warm up. Like, I am, I, I don't just sit down and then, oh, what am I doing? Okay, da -da -da -da. I open up, I kind of look at stuff. That's the great thing about having the program read the book because then I can sit back and have it read the last chunk back to me. And then it kind of gets me into the role. And then sometimes it'll, I'll hear it say, like I use the word dome way too many times. So I read the dome like five times. And I'm like, why am I saying dome so much? For someone's head? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm like, inside a dome, outside a dome, over a dome, honest dome, top, just dome, dome, dome. And I'm like, I gotta get rid of these domes. <laughs> but it's, uh, but you don't know until you, you have it. Um, and, and again, maybe it sucks. Sorry, what was the name of this program? Uh, Scribner. Oh, okay. I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so it will then read back to you what you've typed? Uh, and it's a monotone sort of AI voice? Yeah, it's AI a guy who's just, yeah. Ah, he, they, they have put in breaths. Oh, nice. So you can actually hear the robot taking a breath here oh, and there. Great. And I think it reads um, things in quotes at a, at a slightly faster pace than the other stuff. Cool. So for dialogue, I think it does speed it up a little bit. But um, yeah, I've definitely caught stuff that, because I remember having, I always had table reads of everything for Vampire Mob and I would record it because I would always catch stuff when I listened to the recording. And then I did one, I had a, a screenplay called Sue Happy that the Filmmakers Alliance um, did a reading of and they brought in, they had a casting director, they brought in 25 actors, oh, it cool. was a giant ensemble thing, it crushed, uh, and it was the only time I ever got to see one of my screenplays like almost brought to life, <laughs> like it was a staged reading, but um, but it's it, that is the reason I think that that'll be the next book because I know I know what that story does to an audience, so I know what it can do in book form. Do you have a ritual for like, okay, you've coffeeed up, you're, you're waiting yes. to, do, is there like this ritual to listen to the Scribner notes? Yeah, uh, well one thing, I, I always listen to this, I have a nine, I have an eight hour and 49 minute long playlist of Fats Waller songs. Fats Waller wrote a lot of songs. Um, and I have been listening to that for over a decade. Um, because it, I know all the music really well, so I don't listen to it, but it occupies the part of my mind that can think of something else to do. So I always have that on and only I had to change to tool the band tool <laughs> for a sequence I was writing. And I just like, I couldn't get it with Fats Waller. I, I never had any problem. And I'm like, I need something a little, I'm like tool. And it was perfect. It was exactly exactly what I needed. But uh, yeah, coffee, water, make sure to drink water, everybody. It's important. And um, headphones. And I always write at home. I never write in any coffee shops or anything like that, just because I can close out enough of the world with loud headphones. And I have tinnitus, so I always hear ringing. 
uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, when I have those on, it there's something about 1930s music that that hits the frequency that buries my tinnitus a little bit. Wow. But Except for when Maynard sings. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, there's a, a there's few one, songs. There. There's one Tool song that I'm like, eh, I kind of, that's a little much, but yeah. Do they have a new album? That they do, out brand new. Yeah, yeah. Fear, Fear Inoculum. Oh, on very deck, cool. As do the Pixies. Oh, I bet it's great. What makes a great story, Joe? What makes a great story? Uh, I think I like Roger Ebert's uh, take on it. It's when you don't remember where you parked your car. I think that's, <laughs> that's really uh, good. Yeah, I think when you're in your, when you're in the theater and you're watching the movie, if you don't if you can't think where your car is parked, that's a good movie. And I think uh, for a story, it's different for everybody. I mean. My wife watches stuff that I don't watch and vice versa. And uh, she loves the historical drama stuff and I'm not so much with the historical drama stuff. Um, but she, and she's like, it's just like candy. You know, it's, you know, it's romance. And I'm like, okay, that's great. I'm, I don't want any candy. I guess I don't. But I'm like, I watch Bob's Burgers. I love Bob's Burgers. It's, I think it's a great show. Um, uh, and it's really just a dysfunctional family. It's all a, like every other classic sitcom in the history of everything. And they just have a more grounded take than The Simpsons on that genre. Was the Brady Bunch dysfunctional? The Brady Bunch... On screen. I guess yeah, -screen. technically... Sort of. Hmm. Not, not like now. <laughs> Because really, because uh, All in the Family was really the beginning of like anything close to truth getting on television. So good times, good times. Yeah, all, great, all yeah. the normal air stuff. And they recently did a live reading uh, or live reenactment, and they built the sets. And uh, Jimmy Kimmel had them do an episode of All in the Family and an episode of the Jeffersons, and they had to bleep part of it because you can't say that word on TV anymore. And to hear all the stuff that Archie Bunker said that you can't say on TV anymore. And maybe it would be more useful to hear it on TV now so people could understand what a big it is right out of the gate. That's a good point because it was such a great dynamic of him playing off, forget me, Rob Reiner's character as the meathead yeah. Yeah. And, and this politically active, outspoken young person against this old school yeah. Bigot, and then you have the the codependent peacemaker Edith. Yeah, you know who just wants to make a, him happy. And the thing is, if you watch <laughs> that show, there are episodes that don't leave the living room. Like that is doesn't happen a lot. There aren't a lot of shows that do that. Like Barney Miller was one of those shows that you know you'll have more than one. You'll have the work set and you have the home set. On um, All in the Family was pretty much just the living room and the kitchen. Once in a while, you'd see a bedroom, maybe the front porch. And then maybe you'd go to the Jeffersons once in a blue moon, but almost all of it was like a stage play. What about Welcome Back Cotter? Did they leave the classroom? Yeah, they did. Oh, they did? Okay. Yeah, here and there they did, yeah. Because I think they did the hallways. Let's go back through all the 70s shows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think Barney Miller was genius, just in terms of the setup. Because you have, like, cause, and that's sort of the way I thought about Vampire Mob was that if you have kind of like a few main characters and you rotate in all these other characters, you can build a really big world. And it's also a lot easier to schedule because if you can, you know, I was having actors come in and do four hours. So you would write so they could get what you wanted done in four hours. And then if you can set it up so they're doing more than one day in the story day, then they can show up in more than one episode. And it changes the uh, dynamics of the whole thing. What was the first story that you ever saw, I guess television or film or even that you read, where it lit a, an idea, sparked an idea that this is what I want to do? I want to tell stories. Uh, you know, I never thought I would wanted to do any of this stuff. Uh, I thought I was going to be a photographer. Um, never thought I'd write a story or anything, ever. Uh, I did. I watched a ton of TV as a kid. 
for some reason, I knew some TV term terminology. I knew uh, tag as a kid. I knew the tag in a sitcom because I watched a lot of talk shows and heard people talking about sitcoms. And so that last thing at the end is called a tag that you do. And I'm like, oh, cool. And so I'm like an eight year old going, oh, that's the tag, dad. Oh, good. I don't care. Um, but uh, I was, I guess, was just sort of aware. What interested me was that Barney Miller in, was in New York City and All in the Family was in New York City. Good Times, I think, was in Chicago. Um, Taxi, was, New York City. Taxi was New York City. I always thought I was going to live in New York City growing up. I thought I would be a divorced man living with another divorced man, trying not to drive each other crazy. But. Uh, Perfect strangers? No, no, uh, that's a couple. Oh, okay, so, <laughs> so I was thinking, thinking about yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, But uh, I, I guess I was just so aware that they were shot here as a kid. Like I would always watch it all the way to the end because you were waiting for the next show to start, so you'd see every single credit, and then you'd see shot at ABC Television Studio or CBS Television Studios, and I'm like, so all of that is not in New York. And when you're a kid, it's like. You know, especially when when I'm an hour, I was growing up an hour and a half north of New York, and I'm thinking, oh, Barney Miller, he's just down the just down the train ride down in New York, and you'd sort of think of it that way, and then you think, oh, so they have them all there, and they're in California where it's sunny, and and they're pretending all this. Oh, that's interesting.